Good morning, church. Merry Christmas. Let's go ahead and try that again. Merry Christmas. Hey, listen, if you are new here today and I haven't had a chance to meet you yet, my name is Will, and I serve as one of the elders and pastors here at the church. And uh, today on this Christmas Eve morning, we get the opportunity to conclude our series in the book of Ecclesiastes. Now, for those of you who have been here, you know that over the past 20-ish weeks, we have been working our way through the entirety of the book of Ecclesiastes, verse by verse, passage by passage. And uh, this morning, we get the opportunity to conclude that series. Now, before we jump into the passage, what I want to do is I want to provide you just with a, a quick recap, a quick summary of where we've been and what we've addressed. And I'm doing that for two reasons. One, to give a refresher for the people who have been walking with us through this series, but also to catch everyone up who maybe hasn't had a chance to walk through us in this series, walk with us in this series. So the book of Ecclesiastes is written by a guy named Solomon. And Solomon is the son of King David. Now Solomon became king after David passed away. And we are told that one of the things that God blessed Solomon with is he blessed him with wisdom. And he got wisdom because the Lord showed up in a dream and said, hey, what do you want? And Solomon said, I want wisdom to lead your people. And so God not only gave him wisdom, but he gave him power and he gave him fame and he gave him influence. The problem is, is that even though Solomon received all those things, he ended up squandering those things. It says that he fell into idolatry because he started marrying women of other religions, of all the other faiths, something that God had commanded him not to do. And as a result, he wandered away from the faith. And so for a very significant period of Solomon's life, Solomon uh, essentially lived as if life under the sun was the only thing that existed. For a significant period in his life, Solomon lived as if there was no God. And so essentially the book of Ecclesiastes is written towards the tail end of his life. And what Solomon is doing in this book is he essentially is giving us a summary of all the things that he tried under the sun. He is giving us a summary of all the, the dead ends that he ran into in his pursuit of life and purpose under the sun. So throughout the book, he's talked about things like pleasure and wisdom and politics and vocation and property and all the things that we are tempted to look for, try to find meaning and purpose in under the sun. And so essentially he gets to the end of the book. And if you were here at the beginning, you know that this isn't, wasn't supposed to be a book that was read. It was supposed to be a speech. It was a speech that he wrote. It was a, a discourse that he was giving to a group of people. And that's why Solomon refers to himself as the preacher and the teacher. And so essentially he gets to the end of this book and he's telling us now, in light of all the things that I've tried, tried under the sun, the only option for us is to choose God who is found over the sun. So throughout the book, he's been talking to us about the path of folly and the path of wisdom. So here is essentially what Solomon is doing here. It's a decision-making time. And what he's saying is there's two paths. You could either take the wide road, which is the road of foolishness. It's the road of folly. Or he says... You can take the narrow road, which is the path of life and the path of wisdom. He says this road, if you continue down this road and live as if life under the sun is the only thing that exists, eventually this path of foolishness leads to death. But the other option is not to live in light of folly, but to live in light of wisdom. And he says that this path, the path of wisdom, leads not to death, but leads to life. And the thing about the life that we find is it's not found ultimately under the sun, but it's found in the sun, S-O-N, the Lord Jesus Christ. So this is decision-making time. He's arrived at the end of his book. He's arrived at the end of his discourse. And now he is calling each of us to make a decision. But what's beautiful about the book of Ecclesiastes, some of you may be wondering, why are we in Ecclesiastes on Christmas Eve morning, brother? That's, that's depressing. Well, here's why it's not. Because I would argue that all the questions that Solomon asks in the book of Ecclesiastes are actually answered by the greater Solomon in the beginning of the Gospels. 
that this king actually points us and prepares us for the coming king. And that's what we're going to see this morning. So in light of that, our passage today is Ecclesiastes chapter 12. Ecclesiastes chapter 12. And we are going to be looking at verses 9 through 14. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to Ecclesiastes 12. And we're going to be looking at 9 through 14. And if you are able, I would love for you to please stand for the reading of God's word. Ecclesiastes 12, 9 through 14. And if you are ready, say amen. amen. Solomon, amen, brother. Uh, Solomon writes, Besides being wise, the preacher also taught the people knowledge, weighing and studying and arranging many proverbs with great care. The preacher sought to find words of delight, and uprightly he wrote words of truth. The words of the wise are like goads. Everyone say goads. And like nails firmly fixed are the collected sayings. They are given by one shepherd. Everyone say one shepherd. one shepherd. Then he says in verse 12, My son, beware of anything beyond these. Of making many books there is no end, and much study is a weariness of the flesh. The end of the matter all has been heard. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of men. Verse 14, for God will bring every deed into judgment with every secret thing, whether good or evil. This is the word of the Lord. Let me pray for us. Father, as we come before you this morning in the name of Jesus and in the power of the Holy Spirit, I thank you, Lord, for the book of Ecclesiastes. I thank you, Lord, for how honest it is and how vulnerable Solomon is about all the idols that led him down. Lord, I thank you for the fact that in the book of Ecclesiastes, what we have is one man's testimony of what life under the sun provides. The reality is, is that life under the sun leads us to emptiness. It leads us to hollowness. It leads us to meaninglessness and purposelessness. And so I thank you, Lord, that the book of Ecclesiastes, the first Solomon prepares us for the greater Solomon, that this king prepares us for the coming king. And so I pray that on this Christmas Eve morning, as we look at this passage, that by the time we end, we would leave walking away, not thinking about Solomon, but thinking about the greater Solomon and thinking about the work that Jesus came to do, the work that started in the manger but ended on a cross. Lord, thank you for this morning and thank you for this time. We love you and we ask you. And like I pray every week, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart would be honoring and glorifying to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Lord Jesus, we love you, we need you, and we pray all these things in your holy and precious name. And all God's people said, amen. amen. You may be seated. All right, so Solomon here, like I said, is, is causing us, he's, he's, he's brought us to uh, this, this point at the end of this book, and he's now calling us to make a decision. Are we going to choose the path of folly or are we going to choose the path of wisdom? And what Solomon is going to teach us here in, these, in this brief passage, this short passage, is he's going to teach us that the individual who chooses the path of wisdom knows and believes three truths and three realities about God. The first truth that an individual who walks this path knows and believes about God is that God is their pastor, their pastor. Everyone say pastor. The Bible says that God is our pastor and the wise person knows that and lives in light of that. And we see that in verses nine through 12. He says, besides being wise, the preacher also taught the people knowledge, weighing and studying and arranging many proverbs with great care. The preacher sought to find words of delight and uprightly he wrote the words of truth. I love this, that he says here that knowledge, which comes from God, true wisdom, actually becomes delight. That it's not just the filling of your head, it's the delighting of your heart. He goes on. He says, the words of the wise are like goads. Everyone say goads. Now you're like, what in the world is a goad? Well, a goad was essentially a sharp pointed wooden stick and you would sharpen the end of it and what you would do as a shepherd or as a rancher is whenever your cattle or your sheep was starting to stray away, you would literally poke it with this stick. You would goad it. 
And so you would, if it was starting to wander, if it was starting to drift, you would poke it and it would get their attention and then they would be forced to go in whatever direction you were, you were pointing it. That's what the, a goad is. And that's why he says that the God's wisdom is like a goad. Now, one of the things that God wisdom does, God wisdom does is that when we start to wander off, he, he pokes us. He goads us to move back onto the path that leads to life. But not only does he compare it to a goad, he also compares God's wisdom to nails. He says, like nails firmly fixed are the collected sayings. And I love this. They are given by one shepherd. Everyone say shepherd. One shepherd. That, that this wisdom that is like goads and like nails comes from one shepherd. Then verse 12, he says, my son, beware of anything beyond these. Of making many books, there is no end. And much study is a weariness of the flesh. So what Solomon says here is that the first thing that a wise person knows, that the person who has chosen the path of wisdom knows and understands, is that God is their pastor. God is their shepherd. Now, in this passage, Solomon uses the word hokmah for Hebrew, in the Hebrew for the word wisdom. And that's something that we've talked about a lot in this series because Hokma there, it refers to living a skillful life. Hokma refers to applied knowledge. It's not just information at the head level, but it's applied knowledge at the hand level. And, and what I love about the wisdom that Solomon talks to us about here in this passage is he says there are three things about this wisdom that we need to understand. Number one, he says, this wisdom is sufficient. Number two, he says, this wisdom sticks. And then number three, this wisdom is sourced. So let's look at the three aspects of wisdom. The first thing he says is that wisdom is sufficient. He actually mentions in the passage how we can go to many books and we can study and we can learn and, and we can Google search. But ultimately, the wisdom that comes from God is sufficient. The way Peter puts it, Peter says that in the word and in the work of God, we have everything we need for life and for godliness. That the wisdom of God is sufficient, the Bible teaches. It is sufficient for life and for godliness. Now, the problem is a lot of us don't actually believe that, right? Because if we believed that the word of God was sufficient for life, we would read it every day of our lives. It wouldn't just be verse of the day Christianity, but we would be actually reading scripture every day. We would be renewing our mind in light of it. And I love that he says it's sufficient not just for life, but it's sufficient for godliness. And one of the things we talked about is that godliness in the Bible has nothing to do with how you live and everything to do with how you think. The godly person is the person who thinks like God and the person who thinks of God. Uh, Peter says that the word and the work are sufficient for life and for godliness. And that's why Solomon says uh, all this information is great. Right? We live in a culture that is enamored with information. We live in a culture that has more access to information than ever before, and yet we are the most foolish generation that's ever existed. In spite of all the knowledge that we have access to, that knowledge has not produced wisdom. So the word, he says, the wisdom of God is sufficient. The other thing he says, and I love this, he says that the wisdom of God is sticky. It sticks to you, right? Because he says that the word of God, two things, it's a goad and it's a nail. When, when you are exposed to the wisdom of God, it goads you, right? It's, that's what he, he uses this expression. And then he talks about it being a nail firmly fixed. So, so let me explain it to you this way. I don't know about you, but for me, most of the lessons that I have learned in life have not been from prayer in Bible study. I would love to tell you that's been the case. I read my Bible and I pray. But most of the lessons that I have learned we talked about this when we were looking at Hebrews 12. Most of the lessons have come from violent shaking in my life. It says there in Hebrews 12, the author of Hebrews says that God brings violent shakings. He brings earthquakes into our life so that we might see the unshakable things, the shakable things. That if it wasn't for the shaking, we would never see the shakable things. So, for example, one of the reasons why I idolize people less today than I did four years ago when I got here was because during COVID, there was so much shaking, and I got to see how shakable people actually are. And so, the sh because people are so shakable, it forced me then to go back to the thing in my life that's not shakable, which is God. 
So, so here's the thing. Here's what God does. When, when we are wandering in life, when we are not going in the direction that he has called us to do, he, he goads us. He, he sticks us. It hurts to be goaded by God, to be sticked with a sharp stick in our side, to be pierced. But what God does is he, he sticks us so that the lessons that we learn in that season might stick with us. So the two illustrations connect. He, he, he sticks us so that we might then never forget that lesson and it might stick with us. It becomes like firmly fixed nails. The, the, it, here's the thing. We talked about this throughout this series. If you are asking for God to grow you in 2024, get ready for a lot of suffering. Get ready for a lot of shaking. Get ready for a lot of difficulty. Because what God does is he uses the shaking of life. He uses the goading. He goads us. And it's in those moments of me wandering and me looking for something, uh, uh, looking for my significance and satisfaction and security and something other than him is when he goads me and brings me back that those lessons are actually learned. That's why one of the pastors who I really respect out in, uh, on the West Coast, Larry Osborne, he says that many Christians grow on a need to know, need to grow basis. In other words, I can preach a sermon on suffering and you'll literally not even bat an eye, not even take a note. But then all of a sudden, six months later, you're in a season of suffering and you go back to hear that message and all of a sudden it hits you in a different way because of the season that you are in. So God uses the goading in order to have the lessons that we learn become firmly fixed nails. He sticks us so that the lessons might stick with us. Does that make sense? So it's sufficient, it sticks. And then the third thing, and this is the part that most jumped out at me, True wisdom is sourced, and it's not sourced inside of us internally or in the world around us externally. According to him, true wisdom is found in one shepherd. And what I love about that word there, one shepherd, it's the same Hebrew word that's used in Psalm 23 to describe God. Same Hebrew word. That that, that shepherd who walks with us through the, through the valley of the shadow of death, that shepherd is the source of true wisdom. True wisdom comes from one place and one place alone. You can find information anywhere. You can type in Google and find it. If you're anything like me, my temptation is to idolize information and to think that the more knowledge I have, uh, the more control I have. But what the Bible teaches is that Jesus didn't come to give you information. He came to be your wisdom. And what's beautiful about Scripture, and we're going to see this again in a little bit, is that wisdom is not ultimately a set of precepts, it's not a list of practices. It's not a brand new paradigm. No, wisdom is a person. And when you grow in relationship with that person, you become wise yourself. Because the source of wisdom is the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? And one of the things that stands out to me, I love how he ends. He says, and much study is a weariness of the flesh. It's weary. You know, I, I, one of the things that I've had to experience over the past year or so, I've been working on this biblical theology course that we're going to roll out here in the fall, Lord willing. And I don't know, I'm like I'm booked almost 30 on, on all this stuff. And, and I have what is called theological FOMO. And theological FOMO is the fear of missing out. And so I read book number 29 and I'm like, you know what? I come, I'm, I'm searching something on Amazon. I'm like, I need book number 30. You know what will help? Book number 31. And I have fallen into the weariness of reading and reading and reading and reading. But one of the things that the Lord has convicted me of is that the only way that class will be any benefit to you is if it's based on not the many books, but the one book. That the most important thing I can do for you is give you the word of God. And if those books are only as good as they are rooted in God's word. If they're not rooted in God's word, then they're not worth reading anyways. So what we see is that God is our pastor. God is our shepherd. That's why one of the things that we say here, because scripture says it, is I am uh, not your shepherd, I am your under shepherd. The, the, the over shepherd, the shepherd of this body is Jesus Christ. And the only way you should ever follow me is if I'm following him. Paul says, imitate me as I imitate Christ. He doesn't say just imitate me because I'm Paul. No, no, imitate me as I imitate him. Follow me as I follow him. So God is our pastor. He's our shepherd. Now, one of the things that jumped out at me uh, this week, again, thinking of biblical theology, and biblical theology is essentially taking a theme and looking at it from Genesis all the way through Revelation. 
And one of the things that jumped out at me when I was looking at this passage through a biblical theological lens is this phrase here, one shepherd. And as I was studying it in the Hebrew, what I discovered is that this phrase is only used two other times in the Old Testament. The other two times that it's used is used in the book of Ezekiel of all books. And when Ezekiel talks about this phrase, he uses this phrase, one shepherd in the Hebrew, he is talking about the coming king who will one day bring peace and will one day restore all things. The, the king that we are introduced to in Isaiah chapter nine, the child that is given, uh, the child that is born, the son that is given. So remember this phrase only two other times is used in the Old Testament. Look what it says in Ezekiel 34. For thus says the Lord God, behold, I myself will search for my sheep and will seek them out. Just, this is a, like a little uh, pop quiz, ready? Who is the one doing the searching? God, not a trick question. It's God, right? He says, I will search for my sheep. I will seek them out. God is seeking us. The, the, the gospel is not about sheep finding their shepherd. It's about the shepherd finding his sheep. And then he goes on. He says, as a shepherd seeks out his flock when he is among his sheep that have been scattered, so I will seek out my sheep and I will rescue them from all the places where they have been scattered on a day of clouds and darkness. And then look at what he says. We're jumping to 23 and 24. And I will set up over them one shepherd, same Hebrew phrase. My servant David, he shall feed them. He shall feed them and be their shepherd. And I, the Lord, will be their God. And my servant David shall be their prince among them. I am the Lord, I have spoken. I love that. that it's, it's gonna happen because God spoke it, right? God said it. But here's what's beautiful about this, church. Not only is it the same phrase in Hebrew, if you don't know how the, the Bible works, you might hear this phrase, my servant David, and you're like, oh, hey, cool, cool. He's promising King David. What he's saying is, is that even though things are bad and even though things are rough, one day God is going to provide King David. Here's the problem with that. The book of Ezekiel was written 400 years after David died. So it can't be David, David, because that brother's dead. He's talking to us about the greater David. That's Ezekiel 34. Look what it says again, and this is again Ezekiel. This is the next time where this phrase is brought up. Verse 24 of Ezekiel 37. My servant David, there's David again. You think, okay, well, it's gotta be that guy, right? Shall be king over them, and they shall all have what? Same phrase again. They shall walk in my rules and be careful to obey my statutes. They shall dwell in the land that I gave to my servant Jacob, where your fathers lived. They and their children and their children's children shall dwell there forever. And David, my servant, shall be their prince forever. Again, you know this can't be David because that brother didn't live forever. So he's talking to us about the greater David, about the greater king, about the greater shepherd. There will be one shepherd and there will be one flock. And that shepherd is the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, here's the thing. That's already beautiful enough as it is. But then Jesus in the gospel of John, since we don't know the Old Testament the way the Jews did, we read past this and, and, and don't even realize the connection that he's making. But Jesus in John, he actually identifies himself as the good shepherd. And I want you to see the language that Jesus uses in this passage. He says in John 10, 11 through 16, he says, I am the good shepherd which is beautiful. Not only is he our shepherd, but he is, he is good. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. So in Ezekiel, the good shepherd goes looking for the sheep. In the gospels, not only does he go looking for them, he dies for them. Verse 12, he who is a hired hand and not a shepherd who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. Implication being that he cares for the sheep where the hired hand is not. 
He says, I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. And think about, this is already crazy enough that he knows us and we know him. But if that's not already crazy enough, in verse 15, he talks to us about the depth of the knowledge that we have of one another because he says, just as the father knows me and I know the father and I lay down my life for the sheep. So Jesus there is saying that we, he know, that the relationship that we have with him is like the one he has with the father. Why? Because the Bible teaches that when you place your faith in Jesus, when we said wisdom is not a set of precepts or practices or principles, wisdom is a person. And when you place your faith in that person, you are transferred from being in Adam to being in Christ. So now everything that is true of Jesus is true of you. In light of that, that means that there's nothing you can do to make God love you more. And there's nothing you can do to make God love you less. I don't know what your resolutions are for 2024, but I know this. If you've placed your faith in Jesus as your Lord and Savior, God loves you as much as he loves Jesus. God knows you as much as he knows Jesus. And you get to know him. That's crazy. But it gets better. Everyone say it gets better. Verse 16. And I have other sheep, this is us, for those who have come to know Jesus, this is us, that are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. And I love this part. So there will be one flock and one shepherd. Do you see how beautiful that is? That Jesus Christ knew the Bible well enough to know that not only is he describing himself as the good shepherd, but he says that because of the work that I came to do, there will be one flock and there will be one shepherd. The fulfillment of Ecclesiastes 12 and Ezekiel 34 and Ezekiel 37 is the Lord Jesus Christ. Come on, church. That's crazy. So the, the truly wise person, here's what they do in light of this. The truly wise person has a primary source of identity and the truly wise person has a primary source of information. The, the first thing that a truly wise person has is a truly wise person has a primary source of identity. That if you want to be wise in light of what scripture says wisdom is, you have to remind yourself on a daily basis that you are the sheep and he is the shepherd. Now, here's the thing. I'm, I, it's easy for us to amen that. But if you don't remind yourself of your primary identity on, your, on a daily basis, you will go into your day thinking you are the shepherd and not the sheep. That's the problem when you don't remind yourself of your identity. It says in Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. But if the Lord is not your shepherd, then you will definitely want. You will definitely lack. And one of the things that I fall, one of the traps that I fall into on a daily basis, if I fall into this gospel amnesia and I forget my identity in Christ, and so I go into my day thinking I'm a shepherd instead of a sheep. And one of the things that the Lord really convicted me of this, this week as I was uh, studying is when Jesus says in Matthew 4, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. I never noticed this. Again, it was the Holy Spirit that revealed it to me, but it was, so, it was eye-opening. Once I saw it, I couldn't unsee it. Did you know that there is freedom in following? You see, we live in such an individualistic culture where you are your own God and you are your own Lord and you are your own master and you are your own shepherd. But did you know that there is freedom in following? There's freedom in following. Listen, anyone who's ever led anything here, a family, an organization, a ministry, you know that leading is exhausting. And so what happens is, is that when you understand that you get to follow someone else, there is freedom in following church. That as we step into 2024, there's a freedom there because the, our Savior, our Lord, our Shepherd, our King, He goes before us. That's a reality. Now, the, rea the thing is, you have to remind yourself of it on a daily basis. If you don't, then you're going to go into the, the, this next year thinking you're leading when you're actually following. But man, there is freedom in following because now if I'm following someone, I just got to go wherever he goes. 
If he says to stop, I stop. If he says to lay down, I lay down. If he says to move, I move. But what's beautiful about it is that there's freedom there. There is gospel freedom in following. And anyone who's ever led anything knows exactly what I'm talking about. Now, it doesn't mean that there's no leading in our lives. I'm called to lead this congregation. But like I said earlier, you should only follow me if I'm following him. You should only imitate me if I'm imitating him. But if you understand, for some of you, that's the only thing you had to hear this morning. That there is freedom in following. You don't have to lead. You don't have to take charge because your Savior goes before you. Because one of the things that people don't talk about is if you take his throne, then you also have to take, a, take his thoughts. If you take his crown, you also have to carry his cares. But if you allow God to be God, you allow Jesus to be your shepherd, and you allow yourself to be his sheep, there is freedom in that. But the other thing that Christian, a wise person knows, a wise person understands that not only do we have a primary source of identity, but we have a primary source of information. What I mean by that is he says that there are many books, that there are many books, there are endless books. And then when you go to, to learn and, and seek knowledge under the sun as if there is no God, it's exhausting. It wears you out. But what's beautiful about the gospel is that in the gospel, we have a Bible and the Bible is the word of God. So, so, so get this, when, when one of my biggest prayers when I, when I get up to preach is I pray, Lord, help me to rightly divide your word so that I might show myself approved, not unto man, but unto God. Because if the word of God is rightly divided, this is the actual word of God here. This is the word of God here, church. So when people are like, I haven't heard from God in a while. Well, don't be praying for the Holy Spirit to give you a message uh, 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 from the ether. You, you know, if you want to hear from God, open up your Bible and read it out loud. <laughs> because this is the actual word of God. And unfortunately, there are many people in this city who will claim that this is the word of God. There are people who will claim that the word of God is sufficient uh, for life and for godliness and then get up every Sunday and now preach the word of God. You get a 15 minute funny story. And then you get the Bible of the verse, Bible of the day, Christian, Bible verse of the day, Christianity. Let me take this one verse out of context and tell you how to be a better you. What are we doing here? This is the actual word of God. And so, yes, there are so many people in this church who have studied uh, to be doctors and lawyers and all these other things. Let's pursue knowledge, but let's never forget that true wisdom, the true source of wisdom is found in the word of God. It's like what Spurgeon says, you can visit many books, but you are to live in the Bible. And one of the things that convicts me, honestly, as I, as, I, as I meditate on that, here we are in 2023 going through the book of Ecclesiastes. How many churches, how many generations of Christians have sat under the preaching of this word, this specific passage? Christians from every tribe, tongue, and nation, from every country, They've sat down to, to hear this word preached. The only thing that's everlasting here is, is this. It's like goads, it's like nails. So if, if you ever come here and, and, and it's not this, you have my permission to leave. Because who cares what I think? And honestly, just, this, is, this is free advice. Who cares what you think? If you don't like what it says, then go find somewhere that'll tell you something different. But if this is the word of God, then we have to deal with it. It's not about our emotions, it's about exegesis. So ask yourself, in this season, in this Christmas season, how much am I following as a sheep? And, or, how much am I trying to lead as the shepherd? In this season, are you relying upon yourself or are you relying upon your shepherd? Are you experiencing the freedom of following or are you carrying the burden of leading? Now, the second thing that a wise person understands, a person who's walking down the path of wisdom understands, is that not only is God their pastor, but God is their purpose. Everyone say purpose. Look what it says in verse 13. He says, the end of the matter all has been heard. Fear God 
and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. Solomon says that the second thing that a truly wise person understands is that God is not just their pastor, he's their purpose. And so what he does here in this section, in this one verse that I just read to you, is he addresses two things. He addresses the purpose of the book, but he also addresses the purpose of life. He says, listen, this is the end of the matter. This is the end of the book. All has been heard. I have showed you all the dead ends so that you might choose the path of life, so that you might choose the narrow road that leads to life. But he not only addresses the purpose of the book, he says that the purpose of life is to fear God and to keep his commandments. That a truly wise person has faith in God at the head level, has fear of God at the heart level, and follows God at the hand level. Knowledge only becomes wisdom when it moves from your head to your heart to your hands. That's why some of the most knowledgeable people you know are some of the most foolish people you know. Because knowledge only becomes wisdom when it moves from your head to your heart to your hands. Now, one of the things that we've talked about a lot throughout this series, and we've had to because Solomon talks about it so much, is the idea of purpose. We've talked about the topic of purpose. And what's interesting is not only is that addressed here in this book, but it's actually something that the world under the sun is fascinated by. Our world is fascinated by purpose. You go to Barnes and Nobles or you go to uh, the Kindle store on Amazon and you search the word purpose and you will find hundreds of books by secular people about your why and your purpose and your reason for being here on earth. But according to Ecclesiastes in particular and scripture in general, we are creatures, and because we are creatures, not the creators, we are creatures, because we are sheep and not the shepherd, our purpose can only be found in one place, and that is in the person and work of Jesus Christ. Our purpose is found in a person. It's not found internally in ourselves. It's not found externally in the world around us. It is found in the Lord. The problem is, is that ever since Genesis chapter 3, humanity has forgotten that reality. When sin entered the world, ever since that moment, we have been tempted to find our why and find our purpose in something infinitely smaller than Jesus. That has been our temptation ever since. We look everywhere else. We look towards politics, we look towards sexuality, we look towards romance, we look towards career, we look to everything and anything that's not the Lord. But according to scripture, true purpose is only found, as creatures, is only found in our creator. As sheep, it is only found in our shepherd. Now here's where this passage of Ecclesiastes connects to uh, the, the Christmas story. One of the things that we see in the New Testament is specifically with the Greeks. The Greeks were fascinated with this idea of purpose. What is the, the, the reason or the logos for our existence? Why have we been put here on earth? What is the, the reason and the purpose and the logos for the universe? And in John chapter one, John writing to a, a, a church there in the first century, he addresses this idea of the logos, of the, the reason, of the purpose of life which anyone in that day would have been taken aback by because that's literally books and books and pages and pages had been dedicated to this whole idea of logos and purpose and reason. Look what John says in John 1 about this idea of purpose and reason. He says, in the beginning was the word, which is logos, which is another word for, it's the word for logic or reason or purpose. In the beginning was the purpose and the purpose was with God and the purpose was God. It, it's already crazy enough that the purpose or the logos existed before we existed and that it was with God. No, he takes it a step further. He says, no, the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. 
So according to this passage, this logos, this purpose, he was with God and he is God. And in him, not only do we find purpose, but we find life. And it's not just life in general, but it's life that is actually the light of men. True life is found in a person. That person is the logos, and that logos is the Lord Jesus Christ. Can I get an amen? amen. That's what this means. And that's why you see a connection. That's why I believe that the book of Ecclesiastes sets us up for the gospels. It sets us up for the incarnation. Because because Solomon leaves us in the meaninglessness, in the purposelessness, and then all of a sudden, Jesus shows up and he is our meaning and he is our purpose and he is our logos. Jesus Christ is the logos. He is where we find meaning and purpose. He came not just to, our creator came not just to be our savior, he came to be our mediator and he also came to be who we find our meaning in. You know what's beautiful about this? What this means in light of John 1? We don't find our purpose. That's what Tony Robbins will tell you. That's what Oprah will tell you. Deepak Chopra will tell you. Andrew Tate will tell you. We don't find our purpose. Our purpose finds us. True purpose is not found under the sun, S-U-N. It is found in the sun, S-O-N. And here's what this means, church. What it means is if it's true that Jesus is the logos and that Jesus is our purpose, so often we minimize Christianity to just being this, this message about pardon. But listen, Jesus didn't just come to bring you pardon for the next life. He came to give you purpose in this life. He didn't come just so you can have everlasting life. He came so that you can have an abundant life. He is your pardon and he is your purpose. So here's what this means. If you are sitting here this morning and you claim to be a follower of Jesus, I don't know what your resolutions are for 2024. I don't know. Maybe you don't have any, maybe you have 10. But if you are a follower of Jesus and you are not living in light of the purpose that he has given you, you should change the resolutions. Go ahead and erase them. Don't worry about losing weight. Don't worry about reading more books. Don't worry about watching less Netflix. If you are not a gospel-centered disciple maker who's making gospel-centered disciples, go ahead and erase the list and just do what God says. Because Jesus has given us our purpose. What is our purpose? Well, at the individual level, Matthew chapter 4, he says, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. At the corporate level, Matthew 28, he says, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey all that I have commanded you. So he's given us purpose at the individual level. He's given us purpose at the corporate level. And so if you are a Christian here today and you are not living in light of Matthew 4 and Matthew 28, if you are not a gospel-centered disciple maker who is going out to make gospel-centered disciple makers, don't worry about any other resolution. Instead of figuring out what your purpose is, what's your purpose? Who cares what your purpose is? Your purpose in light of scripture is to be a gospel-centered, God-glorifying disciple maker. Anything else is cultural Christianity. Merry Christmas, huh? My goodness. <laughs> God has given us a compelling message he has given us a costly mission. That is our purpose. A compelling message, which is a proclamation, and a costly mission, which is our purpose. So before we move to the last point, ask yourself this. As you evaluate your purpose and your plan in this season, like right now in this moment, as you evaluate your purpose and your plan for the next month, for the next year, how does your purpose and plan line up with God's purpose and plan in light of Scripture? If it doesn't align, he doesn't have to change. You have to change. He doesn't have to repent and believe. You have to repent and believe. Amen? And then the, the third and final reality or truth that a wise person understands, a person who chooses the path of wisdom that leads to life, is that not only is God their pastor and not only is, not only is God their purpose, but God is their Provision. Everyone say provision. 
And we see that in the last verse of the book, verse 14. He says, for God will bring every deed into judgment with every secret thing, whether good or evil. So here in verse 14, we end with the, the final thing that a wise person knows, which is God is their one and only provision. You see, Solomon here ends what, um, what seems like a very depressing note, right? He ends the book with, with all things. The, he ends with the judgment day. He finishes this long book by addressing the day of judgment. He says that one day every person will have to give an account for everything that was done, both good and evil, even the secret things, he says. Now that might not be bad news for you, but here's why it should be. Because unless you've never sinned, unless you are perfect in every way, at the head, heart, and hand level, then this isn't good news. Verse 14 is bad news. Because according to scripture, what God is going to judge you by is by his perfect law. His perfect law requires perfect obedience, not just at the hand level externally, but at the head and heart level internally. So in light of this standard, all fall short of the glory of God. Every single one of us falls short of the glory of God. That's the bad news. But here's the good news. You see, if this book ended in verse 13, where he talks about fearing God and keeping his commandments, if, that's where Sol if I was Solomon, I probably would have ended there, right? It's not as depressing, it's a little bit more encouraging. Hey, fear God and keep his commandments. Here's the reason why he couldn't end in verse 13 though. Because if he ended in verse 13, you would think that the whole purpose of the book was for you to be more religious. Hey, go and do good things. You know what you need? More religion. Go fear God. Go keep his commandments. If verse 13 was the end of the book, you would leave thinking you need more religion. But since he ends with verse 14, you leave not thinking you need religion. You leave realizing what you need is redemption. And what's beautiful is that the God who he talks about, who will one day judge us, came to bring that redemption. The same God who came to be our pastor and our purpose is the same God who came to make a provision. What the gospel teaches us is that the shepherd of the sheep also became the savior of our soul. But here's the question. How would God make the provision? How would the provision be made? How can God, on the one hand, keep his holy standard and yet at the same time display his shepherd's heart? Well, here's the thing. If all we have is Ecclesiastes, Solomon almost leaves us hanging, right? Because he ends with judgment and then just leaves you there. He's like, hey, good night, Merry Christmas, have a good one. We're all gonna be judged one day. But what's beautiful, though, is that even though Solomon kind of leaves it all open-ended, there's another Old Testament passage that actually provides a solution to the problem that Solomon presents. There's another Old Testament passage that provides a cure to the disease that Solomon diagnoses. And that passage is actually Isaiah 8 and Isaiah 9. And if you have, if you have an opportunity at some point this week, I would encourage you to read Isaiah 8 going to Isaiah 9. And again, this connects with the Christmas story because so often during Christmas, we come together and we talk about Isaiah chapter nine and how there's a, there's a child that is born and there's a son that is given and he shall be wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace. And everyone cheers and goes home and drinks their eggnog, right? But here's the reality though. The reality though is that the only way you will ever appreciate Isaiah 9 is if you first read Isaiah chapter 8. Because in Isaiah chapter 8, I would say, is one of the most um, Ecclesiastes adjacent passages in Scripture. When you look at Isaiah 8, it's almost like Isaiah and Solomon are reading off the same script. Because Isaiah essentially talks to us about what the world was like before the Messiah. 
And the description that he gives to us about the world is eerily similar to life under the sun that, Ecclesi that Solomon talks about in Ecclesiastes. And here's what Isaiah says about humanity under the sun. He says there are three things that marked humanity prior to the arrival of Jesus. Number one, he said that humanity was marked by a sinful conduct. It says that they lived and they walked in darkness and in gloominess. So they were sinful at the hand level in their conduct. But then, if that's not bad enough, he says they were also sinful and broken at the heart level. In Isaiah 8, it talks about how humanity was marked by anxiety and anguish and gloom and sadness and anger. That's, that's what humanity was marked by in Isaiah chapter 8. And then the last thing, not only were they sinful at the hand level and the heart level, but even at the head level, it says in Isaiah chapter 8 that they looked to God not for counsel, but to curse him. That they looked to the world for counsel. They looked to the mediums and to the necromancers. But it said that when they looked up to God, instead of, to, instead of looking to God to, to seek counsel, they looked up to God to curse him, it says. So that's the condition of the world, right? Isaiah 8 is, is, is like him and Solomon are, are, are working off the same playbook. So into all the darkness and all the brokenness, Isaiah 9 happens. And what's beautiful about Isaiah 9 is that we are told that the answer that God provides had three aspects or three layers to it. Number one, he said that the, the Savior that God provided, the light that God provided was personal. How do we know it's personal? Well, because it says in the text that unto us, he's given. Unto us. It was a personal gift from God to us. But we also see that he's personal because he says that a child is born. That language there has to do with his humanity, that he was born. Then it refers to him as a wonderful counselor and as the prince of peace. So he is personal. But not only is he personal, according to scripture, he's also powerful because in that same passage, not only is a child given, a, a, a child born, but a son is given. Think about what that means. What it means is, is that he existed beforehand and he showed up. That, that has to do with his divinity. Not only is a child born, his humanity, but a son is given his divinity. And that same son that was given, according to Isaiah chapter 9, came to be mighty God and everlasting father. So he's personal, he's powerful, and he came to be our provider because according to Isaiah chapter 9, it says that we now, he came to break the yoke of oppression so that we then can divide the spoils with him. So that we can participate in a victory that we didn't even fight for. It says that we can burn the boots, we can toss away the weapons, we can divide the spoil because in Christ we are more than conquerors. In Christ we are overwhel overwhelming victors, but not because of anything that we've done because we didn't even raise a finger, but because of what he's done. So Jesus Christ steps into the under the sun world that Solomon describes. He steps into the darkness and the brokenness that Isaiah describes and he came to be personal and powerful and a provider. He is the provision that Solomon is pointing to. Even though Solomon doesn't say it explicitly, he sets us up for he, the questions he asks, sets us up for the answers Jesus provides. So even though, as later on Isaiah says, even though we all like sheep have gone astray and have gone our own way, he laid on him the iniquity of us all. So even though the sheep are the ones that sinned, God laid on him the punishment and the wrath and the iniquity. It says there in Isaiah that he was pierced for our transgressions. He was goaded for our transgressions. Through his acceptable life and atoning death, Jesus Christ came to provide help for the helpless, hope for the hopeless, light for our darkness, and life for our deadness. The Bible says that the creator in the garden is the same as the baby in the manger, who is the same as the savior on the cross, who is the same as the king on his throne. And the truly wise person not only sees him as all those things, but the truly wise person sees him as pastor, as purpose, and as provision. Jesus didn't come to earth so that we can have a holiday. He came to earth so that we might have hope. 
And you will only adore him and acknowledge him as pastor and as purpose if you are willing to first accept him as your provision. Amen. Merry Christmas, Mission Church. Merry Christmas. Such a great morning. My name is Whitney Clay. I'm Olivia Robbins. We're so excited that you're here this morning, that we get to celebrate Christmas with you as a big church family. So Merry Christmas. And we're at the end of Ecclesiastes. It's over. (laughs) I never thought we'd see this day. (laughs) I'm kind of sad. I am. I know. I feel mixed emotions about it. I feel like it's been super good. Yeah. But what a great way to end it on Christmas. Such a great sermon. Mm -hmm. A great sermon. Stephen's moderating. So talk to him. Tell them how you're doing. Tell them where you're watching from. I don't know. If you have questions, let them know. Yeah. If something um, stood out to you, let them know. If we're, we're, we're talking about this and going through these questions, if something stands out, let us know. If there's something we can be praying for you about, let us know. There's this QR code right up here. Um, if you scan that, um, you can fill out a form, and it's going to allow you to respond mm-hmm. um, and let us know how we can resource you, encourage you, pray for you. Um, and this is just a really helpful tool. So if there's in any time you would like to respond, just it's up here. You <laughs> know, we love to, to hear from you. Yeah. You know what to do. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So I'm going to start off and reread our passage today. It's a shorter one, you guys. Mm-hmm. So, um, that'll be good. We're in Ecclesiastes 12, nine through 14. Besides being wise, the preacher also taught the people knowledge, weighing and studying and arranging many proverbs with great care. The preacher sought to find words of delight, and uprightly he wrote, he wrote words of truth. The words of the wise are like goads, and like nails firmly fixed are the collected sayings. <laughs> they are given by one shepherd. My son, beware of anything beyond these, of making many books there is no end, and, um, and much study is a weariness of the flesh. The end of the matter, all has been heard. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God will bring every deed into judgment with every secret thing, whether good or evil. Mm. Even as we're reading that, I'm like, oh. I know. <laughs> <laughs> that punched me in the face. Um, but it's it's really good. So my question for you, and I'll answer too, yeah. um, did God teach you anything new today? Um, did this truth comfort, convict, challenge, or com- um, comfort you? Words yeah. are really hard. I think it was kind of both confronting, convicting, <laughs> challenging, and comforting. <laughs> oh, girl has um, a little bit of everything. Which, which is what scripture <laughs> does, right? It leads us right where yeah. we are. Uh, and so I'm not sure how you felt. Maybe share that with Stephen. But for me, the part that really stuck out to me was when he was talking about um, God as our pastor. Mm. And then he talked about understanding our identity, um, that we're sheep and that he is the shepherd and that he's the ultimate gift. And I just thought there's so many other things that every day I think are the ultimate gift, mm-hmm. those idols that I'm tended to put on the throne of my yeah. heart when really it's Jesus. Yeah. And um, when he said, quit trying to be the shepherd when you're the sheep, I like wrote it down, underlined it, highlighted it. <laughs> uh, I kept writing, you are the sheep. <laughs> you are his sheep. Yes, his sheep. And just that that personal, mm-hmm. that he's the pe- he is our God. He is our shepherd. He is our good shepherd who mm-hmm. loves us and comes alongside us no matter how we feel, yeah. you know, how matter our emotions are lying to us or whatever the yeah. world is telling us. And I love that he's going to be teaching on emotions in the beginning of the year because I'm going to feel super convicted about that one <laughs> too. Uh, but all these things that I just daily, and I think that's the thing, daily preaching the gospel to ourselves, mm-hmm. daily reminding mm-hmm. ourselves um, that he is a good father, that he is the good shepherd, he is the one true shepherd, uh, and he is the ultimate gift. And those yeah. are the things, that's the moment you know, that I'm just so easy and quick to forget. Yeah. Um, as you're talking, uh, the, he brought this up, but Psalm 23, I like, I feel like mm-hmm. that is just ingrained in my head, not only because my, my parents used to say all the time, but in, in high school, we sang that in choir. Oh, and yeah. so like, then I hear like the, the choral version of it, in my, <laughs> my head. Anyways, that's besides the point, but it is such good truth. So even if you have time today to read through mm-hmm. that, yeah. um, just like think through what the shepherd does. Yes. And what the what the sheep do? Yeah. And th- what they do is they receive. Yes. And they they they're obedient mm-hmm. and and they delight in the Lord. Yeah. Um, and so um, that's just an encouragement um, to all of us today mm-hmm. that we can rest in the Lord, delight in Him, um, and remember that 
there is freedom in following. So yes. after I'm talking about Jesus being the ultimate gift, he talks about how there's freedom in following. And I think sometimes things get really chaotic and messy and hectic and stressful. And usually that's when we're trying to take control. Yeah. That's where I get convicted too. It's like, man, everyone keeps asking me how this month's going. And I'm just saying it's really busy, but I, <laughs> I think it's because I'm just trying really hard yeah. to take control and figure things out on my own. And, um, or we it, don't want to wait on his timing, so yeah. we run out ahead. Or we're like, you know what? I got it. Yep. You just sit down. Take take a load off. Yep. I'll, I'll take care of it this time. Um, but there is a lot uh, more freedom when you're following the Lord mm-hmm. and being obedient to him and able to see the ways that he does provide and the ways that he does um, call you to obedience. Yeah. And a lot of that process, which is, is to make us look more like him, but to show us the things in a gracious way that, that don't and the things that we need to lay down. And so um, it's hard, but we're we're all in it together. And it's also because he loves us and he wants us to look like him. And he doesn't want those things um, to take root in our heart um, and then become something that we don't even realize how Mm. much it's, we're so blinded by sometimes our idols. And so um, in his gracious kindness, he shows us those things and, um, that helps us to yeah. um, so good. follow him. Yeah, um, but it's hard. It's yeah. harder to do that than it's, it's easily <laughs> said. But yeah. um, but there is freedom when we, we follow the Lord and trust him um, with that. So, so yeah. in our same passage in verses 9 through 12, we learn that God is our shepherd and that all absolute truth flows from him. So what happens to us when we forget that reality? What are some of the pseudo shepherds that we're tempted to follow instead? I thought that was a really good question. Yeah, I'm like, ah. Everybody just bear with us. <laughs> it's hard. It's hard. You're going to think of different things than I like. But it, when we're called out on that kind of stuff, mm-hmm. you're like, oh, it's fine. I don't do that. And you do. Um, and I do too. And so uh, when we forget that reality, we forget our identity yep. um, in the Lord. Ultimately, like we're going to place our identity and our worth and our value in other things. Um, some of the things I can think of off the top of my head is like a calendar. Like I'm going to follow what is mm-hmm. on this calendar and I planned this. So this is happening and I don't have any time for <laughs> flexibility because this was planned six months in advance and that's not real life. You don't yeah. know what, what's going to come. Obviously we can still make plans, but when you place like that as like yep. a small idol or uh, I think of like what people tell you, how mm-hmm. many people have told you, girl, you're going to blank. You're going to do this. You're going to do this. You're yeah. going to have blah, 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 blah. And it's like, um, you're not God. Right. Um, and you don't know. Um, and some people, who knows? Like, they may really just want to encourage someone in that way. But you have to be really careful because some people will stop what they're doing and mm. change direction to follow what someone else has said about them. Yeah. Or, I mean, if you're in our culture right now manifesting things is a huge thing. Like Mm. I'm going to speak it into existence. This is my year, 2024, (laughs) best year, best me. Oh my gosh. Oh yeah. And real talk, (laughs) like we need Jesus so bad. And it's, and it's not like you can, you can't speak something into existence. You can't will it into existence. And some things you probably can like, and you're going to end up in a mess. Mm. You're gonna end up in a chasing your own path, trying to leave big you old mess, and you're shepherd. gonna and you're gonna feel really empty and really um, insignificant. You're gonna be trying to find your worth in whatever it is that you're chasing after. Yeah. Um, so I think that it can be mostly anything. Mm. Um, I mean, I think like your bank account can be something that you yeah. follow. Like, oh, I got all these dollars. I should, which I don't, uh, for the record, um, I should do this. And it's like, no, like, yeah, I need to pray how to use what God has given me. And sometimes that does mean enjoying those things. Mm-hmm. And he does allow us to do that. But sometimes we just get really selfish. Yeah. Um, but I, what are other things you can well, think I of? Well, I even thought when you were talking about just the different people speaking those truths to you, like how important your community is, that you're able to kind of in a trusted community with other believers, share things that you've heard or share yeah. truths you might be believing or lies that you're believing that other believers need to call out yeah. and say, hey, that's not what God's word says. Like yeah. that's not at all what scripture says. Quit listening to that Instagram preacher or to your bank account or to that idol that's preaching to yeah. your heart and your mind and actually go to scripture. And instead of reading scripture for what you want it to say, read it for what it actually says. Well, and it goes back to Jesus being the ultimate gift. If he's the yes. ultimate gift, he's all you need for life and godliness. Mm-hmm. And so, I mean, if, yeah. if someone's told you, 
girl in 2024, you're going to find your man. That's your, that's your year, girl. That's it. Speak that truth. Um, no, girl, unless God tells me that, right? I can't be like so. Because then what happens, and I've had people call me and say that to me or say that to me in passing, or people call me and tell me that that's there hmm. next year. And I'm like, well, first of all, hold the phone. Yeah. Like you have to wait on the Lord and it's yeah. not, that's not going to bring you any more significance than you think it is. But I think it's like, it's very easy yeah. to well, forget that Jesus is the prize. And it's easy when people are preaching to the idols that we want to chase or yeah. those things, whatever that may be like, Hey, you're going to get more money this year. You're going to get a new job this year. You're going to all yeah. those things. And it's like, Oh, I, that sounds great. Like, why wouldn't I believe that? Yeah. Well, cause you're preaching to an idol of my heart. Well, and it's like surrendered. that desire fuels it to become more of an idol. Yeah. And some, that's why you have to really keep giving the Lord the things that you desire. Otherwise yeah. they grow and they grow and they fester. And then next thing you know, you're like so caught up and consumed with that, that you can't even focus on the Lord yeah. and you can't even like, uh, read his word without picturing it for yourself, exactly. you know? And yeah. so I think, I think it gets really dicey pretty mm-hmm. quickly if we're just being real. And so. just being able to like read it for what it is for the context it was written. And then in godly community to talk about it and say, am I understanding this right? Yeah. Am I yeah. treating this passage the way it should be? Or am I trying to preach to myself, mm-hmm. you know? And remembering so. that Jesus has given you everything you need for life and godliness. Yeah. So, mm. okay. In Ecclesiastes 12, 14, we discover that in the gospel, God has made the ultimate provision in order to address and solve our ultimate problem. According to scripture, what is our ultimate problem and what does the gospel specifically provide to address it? Mm. Well, I was really uh, convicted when he was talking about our purpose and our plan, like for 2024, what we were talking about and how if it's not to make gospel-centered disciples, then our purpose is all wrong. Yeah. And that is because that's our greatest need. Like our greatest need is that we are sinners in need mm-hmm. of a savior. Mm-hmm. And w- the beautiful thing about Christmas is we're reminded that Jesus stepped right in the middle of our mess, like mm-hmm. our good and grateful shepherd. Like he stepped in. Yeah. To ch- it makes me emotional, like yeah. to chase yeah. us, to come for us yeah. because he loves us and we're his beloved yeah. and we're his sheep. Yeah. And so that is our problem. Our problem is that we are sinners in need of a savior and no matter how good we try to be or how well we try to chase these idols or prove or strive nothing 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 we bring to the table Mm -mm. cleanses us from our sin except for the blood shed on the cross by Jesus because he lived the perfect life and died on the cross and rose again so that we could be with him he's the ultimate gift and so today if you're sitting there and you're thinking I've never understood that I've never understood that I'm chasing idols or I'm trying to strive and prove when I don't have to I can just rest in the finished work of Jesus Um, he has come to answer our problem to the answer the sin that separates us from God Mm -hmm. and he did that in himself through the work of the cross and so the finished work of Jesus it's done there's nothing more we can do we can't add anything to the gospel Mm -hmm. that's where I get tripped up I'm like let me let me show you how good I am he's like no 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 (laughs) no more you know and we can just rest in that and so be reminded of that today like that's Mm -hmm. the beauty of the gospel and the beauty of Christmas that he came for us and so um if you if you're struggling with that today or have questions fill out that QR code and reach out to us talk to Stephen we're here we'd love to chat with you and pray with you and help you know more um about what Jesus has done for us and I and I pray that today can be a day where you surrender it can be a day of salvation and um, that you can experience the freedom of following Jesus today Um, because it truly is the best gift that you could ever receive Um, and it's nothing that we could do to earn it no (laughs) truly it's it's a gift and there's nothing we could do to make that right and only God himself could do that and so it's it's a beautiful gift and I pray that you can have hard conversations today um if if you're not with somebody to talk about that feel free to reach out to us yeah if you're with somebody that you feel comfortable asking those questions to please do um yes. we're praying over your conversations we're praying um for you as you process yeah we love you guys and we're here for you um we want to let you know too next week there's no in-person services so if you're in the area and you're planning on coming every service will be right here <laughs> at 10 at 10 online uh, we love you guys we're so thankful for y'all and we hope you have a very merry christmas yes